Peace has been declared in Colombia. The news comes on Monday, August 29th, as the Colombian Revolutionary Armed Forces, or FARC commander Timo León Jiménez, also known as Timochenko, and President Juan Manuel Santos, both ordered their respective parties to cease all hostilities. The historic announcement comes after a long process. Formal negotiations began in Havana, Cuba, in February of 2012. And now, four years later, people celebrated in the streets of Bogota and the rest of the country as the world's longest-running civil war comes to an end. In the context of the peace process, the Real News Network gained exclusive access to a rebel camp in the Colombian jungle, where we'll take a look at why the conflict existed in the first place. It's early in the morning, deep in the Colombian forest. Leftist guerrilla fighters train in formation. Countrywide, many thousands of them control patches of the forest, patrolling, building camps, and moving on. The FARC guerrillas stay under the trees, hiding from helicopters patrolling overhead. They are constantly on the move in a battle they have been fighting for more than 52 years. We are somewhere in the northwest of Colombia. This is a rare sight that very few outsiders have gotten to see. That is without being in a firefight or having a gun pointed at their head. Traditionally defending leftist activists and peasant farmers, or in Spanish, campesinos, from wealthy landowners, the FARC is the oldest insurgent army in the world. What started as a political witch hunt turned into a civil war, waged by many factions for control of territory, people, mineral resources, and eventually, drugs. It has also been the cause of an often overlooked refugee crisis. According to a 2013 study by Colombia's National Center for Historical Memory, as many as 220,000 people have lost their lives to this conflict. By 2014, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees announced that more than 6 million civilians have been forced from their homes. This is one of the largest refugee populations in the world, second only to Syria's 7.6 million displaced people. Bueno, teniendo en cuenta las posibilidades que se han tratado desde el principio, desde el nacimiento de la FARC, pues lo que hoy llevamos es, una, es un gran avance. Pues me parece a mí que hemos avanzado bastante. Tenemos una, una proyección real de que puede, podemos dar un paso a una paz real. Commander Mauricio Jaramillo is one of six members of the political bureau, FARC's top brass, and also a part of the negotiation commission. Nunca en la historia de los acuerdos posibles con el gobierno, nunca habían pasado el primer punto. Ahora ya hay, eh, en las discusiones y en el avance de la mesa, llevamos todos los puntos vistos de lo que está planteado en la agenda. Issues of land reform, justice for the victims of the conflict, and notably the involvement of the guerrillas with drug trafficking allegedly as a way to fund its fight, have all been discussed at the negotiating table. President Santos promised there will be no impunity for those in the FARC who committed crimes. In Havana, the Colombian government released information about the location of approximately 100,000 bodies of people extrajudicially executed by the state or paramilitary forces who, according to three official inquiries, often did the dirty work for army and government officials. There is now an ongoing national effort to try and identify the victims that in some cases were buried in unmarked graves near the places they were found, and in other cases were piled up in hidden mass graves. Those bodies are now being exhumed and returned to their families. The discovery of most of the graves is not new. It's the result of confessions obtained by the government in previous official investigations. This information was just recently released as part of the peace process. The origin of these killings often lies in the use of so-called false positives, or when farmers and civilians were murdered and disguised as guerrilla members by state army officials seeking to advance their careers by producing more enemy kills. Semana, a weekly political magazine that has been publishing for over 30 years, documented cases of army officials accepting money to act in alliance with the paramilitary forces, killing civilians and then using the bodies to produce higher death enemy counts. In this context, President Juan Manuel Santos denied any kind of amnesty for any Colombian military individual or unit that was accused of violating human rights during this conflict. No puede existir amnistías para los miembros de nuestras fuerzas armadas. Eso está establecido con toda claridad en las sentencias, por ejemplo, de la Corte Interamericana de Derechos Humanos. 
The rest of these bodies were produced by the traditional enemy of the FARC, known as the Autodefensas Unidas de Colombia, or AUC, which killed civilians whom they accused of collaborating with the guerrillas. With at least 11 massacres on record, during the second half of the 1980s, the AUC unleashed terror, torture, and rape upon civilians, kidnapping and killing them by the thousands, often whole towns at a time. Eventually, the AUC became infamous for cutting off limbs with chainsaws and cannibalizing their victims, spreading fear all across the country. Many times, they used murder and rape to scare farmers from their homes, others acting in collaboration with the army to commit massacres. All of these horrors have been extensively documented over the years. The AUC established a brutal language of death, executing and mutilating anyone accused of being a leftist or a community organizer, leaving their bodies to carry a message for everyone else. These are the bodies that are being exhumed all over the country. On July 15, 2003, over 31,000 members of the paramilitary group Autodefensas Unidas met with the Colombian government under then-President Álvaro Uribe, himself accused of having deep ties with the AUC. They signed a widely criticized agreement to surrender their weapons, confess their crimes, and submit to justice with reductions on prison terms. The final document was authorized by Colombian Congress in 2005 under pressure by President Uribe and was revised a year later to provide more strict regulations. It's been over 10 years since then, but much remains the same. The FARC leaders were also pressed by the government to surrender their weapons, but expressed concern that disarming would leave them vulnerable to assassination by paramilitary bands. This was the main concern to be resolved as the insurgents' brass needed to trust that the Colombian government would control the backroom, short for criminal bands, or what the neo-paramilitary groups are now referred to as. After years of massacres, there is a deep fear that the paramilitary bans have instilled on guerrilla fighters and their sympathizers. Coupled with the distrust toward the Colombian army, it can be understood why some fighters resist the idea of surrendering their weapons up to the very end. On July 6, 2013, the Armando Rios Front within the FARC issued a statement in which they communicated their decision to continue the fight and not surrender their weapons. A similar situation happened with the Autodefensas Unidas peace process when some armed bands refused to surrender and stayed armed and mobilized, eventually becoming the backroom or criminal bands. President Santos responded with a warning. This is your last chance to surrender. You'll end up dead or in a cell. While it is unclear if Commander Isabella San Roca will join these rebel cells, at the time of the interview, she echoed the sentiment. No, nosotros estamos hablando de de que vamos a hacer dejación de armas en la medida que hayan unas garantías de seguridad. Jamás hemos hablado de entrega de armas, ni lo vamos a hacer, porque sería como echar a la basura más de 51 años de lucha. Some say the conflict's roots go back more than 51 years and may also go far beyond the country's borders. Many experts, such as Mario Murillo in his book Colombia and the United States, War, Unrest and Destabilization, consider this conflict to be part of the Cold War, where class repression supported by U.S. foreign policy restarted a previous 10-year bloody conflict among the same historical liberal versus conservative and rich versus poor factions, spelling the end of several years of a fragile but consensual peace. Murillo describes how acting in synchrony with the local oligarchy, the U.S. intervened in Colombia's asymmetrical war, supporting and arming special military units, giving military aid and training army officials at the School of the Americas in Fort Benning, Georgia. These forces then conducted so-called strong anti-communist repression on rural farmlands, murdering, torturing, and displacing hundreds of thousands. Desde el punto de vista político, En el 64, nosotros estábamos dando los mismos pasos que estamos dando ahora. Es otro, otra, otras épocas, ¿no? Uh -huh. Pero es lo mismo. Nosotros estábamos buscando la paz desde el primer momento. Nosotros, desde, en el primer momento, nosotros buscamos 
eh, la posibilidad de hablar con el país. Mandamos cartas a todo el mundo, a las universidades, a los intelectuales, eh, y, y, y realmente no fuimos escuchados en ningún lado. Y el Estado metió una arremetida de 16.000 hombres. This is reflected in the declaration made by the founders of the insurgent group, made on Colombia's Independence Day, July 20th, 1964. Lo que estaban buscando en esa época era lo mismo que estamos planteando ahora, una salida para los problemas de la población. Y bueno, no quisieron desde ese momento, o sea, desde ese momento estamos planteando de que el gobierno tiene una perspectiva distinta de cómo es la solución de los problemas. Y siempre la conclusión es que hay una salida violenta al tratamiento de todos los problemas. The persecution in the 60s were repeated in the late 80s and early 90s. Many of the main political figures of the left were hunted down and murdered, including a whole political party called Union Patriotica, and an unknown number of people were disappeared, tortured, and murdered as an example for the rest. Many fear history can repeat itself again because the backroom could hunt down the FARC members when they re-enter civilian life. Initially, the Colombian government argued that the backroom would pose no such threat once the FARC takes up a political role in society, arguing that these new paramilitary groups are motivated by profit, not politics. But the numbers and the facts tell a different story. According to a 2014 report by United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, the backroom are the main groups responsible for the great majority of human rights violation in modern Colombia. In many cases, led and operated by former AUC paramilitary leaders who gravitate around the drug business. Todd Howland from the UNHCR confirmed what seems to be a play straight out of the book by the Auto Defense of Unidas that backroom almost regularly used terror to inflict social control that continues to affect the full range of human rights of the population, in particular, those of the defenders of human rights, community leaders, public officials, police, and land claimants. Semana Magazine writes that the backroom are interested in sabotaging the peace process with the FARC so that the government can't concentrate the might of the army on the criminal bands or backroom. But while the Colombian government ignores any political component and classifies the new paramilitary groups as plain criminal bands, the UN now recognizes that the backrooms often dispossess farmers from their lands or silence opposition to mining projects and intimidate unions, journalists, and even local authorities who sometimes have to choose between silver or lead, between paying protection money or being killed. <laughs> The daily newspaper El Tiempo reports that since 2012, there is a total of 332,000 victims, counting extortion, rape, kidnapping, torture, and land theft, 8,194 assassinations, and 560 disappeared, who are likely to have been murdered as well. Like William Oime, an indigenous governor of a rainforest reserve who opposed a mining project in the jungle. Or the 14-year-old daughter of a community leader. These cases are just two examples of a broader pattern of terror. Pues muchas razones sociales que hay en Colombia que hacen que que no solamente las mujeres, sino que la gente más desfavorecida pues opte por venirse para la insurgencia pero no es tan poco por lo que somos desfavorecidos, es por las condiciones sociales que hay en Colombia, porque no hay cómo hacer oposición a un régimen de otra forma. Si por lo menos uno lo hace en una organización social, o lo hace en una organización de derechos humanos, o en un sindicato, pues uno sabe que va a ser asesinado, porque en Colombia no hay otra, otra forma pues, de uno rebelarse en contra del Estado. Lo podemos mirar nomás los de marcha patriótica. ¿Cuántos van asesinados? Y eso que no es una organización clasista, Es una organización amplia donde, puede, donde cabe cualquier persona pues, que esté incómodo con alguna cosa. ¿Y cuántos líderes de, de esa organización social han sido asesinados? Historically, this lack of legal mechanisms to struggle for political power is what motivated many to pick up arms. But others were simply trying to defend themselves in some communities from paramilitary forces and military units raiding their towns at night and disappearing people. 
Estoy en afar por... Porque soy de, de sangre, sangre comunista, sangre guerrillera. En ese, en ese espacio, pues, la persecución del, del paramilitarismo a, por ser familiar de un guerrillero. Entonces, por mi vida me ingresé a la FARC. Y él cuando, la década de los 80, de los 90, él, él fue perseguido por los paramilitares, cuando la persecución contra la los sindicalistas de la Unión Patriótica, los que... Entonces, a no, co a no cogerlo a él, pues, perseguían a la familia. This trend of violence and massacres continue to this day, leaving Colombia a traumatized country, with war scars that turn into more violence as generations succeed each other. 30 years ago, the Union Patriotica members were hunted and executed. Now, it's the members of the Marcha Patriotica, a similar party, who are the ones being kidnapped, tortured, and killed. Si uno pone a mirar un ejemplo, hay desigualdad en casi todos los países de Sudamérica, pero hay una democracia más amplia donde la gente se puede organizar, donde la gente puede, pues, demostrar que está inconforme con el régimen, donde incluso democráticamente pueden hacer uso de, de ese derecho, pueden demostrar su inconformidad. En cambio, en Colombia no se puede. En Colombia, un liberal que está inconforme con alguna cosa del, de, de, del Estado también es perseguido. Lo podemos mirar nomás los de marcha patriótica. ¿Cuántos van asesinados? Y eso que no es una organización clasista, es una organización amplia donde, puede, donde cabe cualquier persona pues, que esté inconforme con alguna cosa. ¿Y cuántos líderes de, de, de esa organización social han sido asesinados? After decades of conflict and three peace processes, Frente Nacional 1958, the AUC in 2005, and the FARC in 2016, the alarming trend goes on. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of new cases that can be read about in Colombian literature and press, and many more no one will ever know about. Los organizadores, los, los, la, los líderes sociales están siendo perseguidos por bandas criminales, supuestamente que le llaman bandas criminales porque son los mismos paramilitares, por los policías, por los soldados. Usted no ha mirado en las protestas en Bogotá, por lo menos cuando el paro agrario, cómo no le andaban a la gente. Con una, un policía con una ametralladora y, un, y una persona protestando por ahí con una piedra. En cambio en las FARC sí, pues, hay mejores condiciones, porque bueno, ellos con una ametralladora, pero nosotros también las tenemos. An important step before the implementation of the peace agreement can take place is the referendum vote by Colombia citizens, which is set to take place on October 2nd of this year. On July 18th, Colombia's constitutional court declared that the result of the referendum will be binding, forcing any government to recognize it. According to the nation's top constitutional authority, it will take another referendum to void or change the result of the peace agreement once approved by the country's voters. But there are many who have suffered trauma at the hands of the FARC and could vote against the agreement. The FARC's tactics are both militaristic and unconventional and have included civilian targets and the widespread use of kidnappings, even children who were either abducted for ransom or forcibly recruited. <laughs> The best known case is that of Senator Ingrid Benecourt, who, after being kept captive for six years, was rescued by the Army in 2008, along with three American contractors and 11 Colombian Army soldiers. All of this has antagonized a large segment of the population who disapprove such actions by the FARC, especially among the upper and middle class. Additionally, the Colombian right has already started to campaign against the agreement ratification, as it was established by President Juan Manuel Santos since the beginning of the negotiations. In August 2015, there were marches to show opposition to the peace process. Former right-wing President Uribe gathered thousands of alleged victims of violence by the FARC. Commander Isabella San Roque dismisses this as an expression of the ultra-right. Entonces, que toda esa gente que se moviliza con Uribe, todo ese fenómeno paramilitar, a highly organized army, the FARC, by July 2016, had become a key player in the country, with an estimated 10,000 mobilized soldiers covering the southeast and northwest of the country. The FARC's power has declined since it peaked in 2007, with around 18,000 armed guerrillas who dominated entire parts of the country. But by the end of the peace process, it still possesses a profound influence on the countryside. The peace agreement that was signed on August 24, 2016, could play a key role in Colombia's future development, replacing internal armed conflict with the construction of political relations between the members of the now antagonistic social groups, 
which in turn could contribute to the creation of a more inclusive and just society. Entonces yo digo, bueno, que se abran las puertas de la democracia, pero que también hayan garantías, que la gente no la asesinen, que la gente tenga acceso a los medios de comunicación, lo mismo que tienen los partidos tradicionales, que tenga la misma, o sea, que el gobierno financie esos partidos, porque si vamos a hacer como ahorita que dicen que bueno, que los partidos de la gente más humilde tienen ellos mismos que financiarse. Eso no se puede o que una cantidad de firmas, o sea, le ponen trabas a la gente para que la gente no pueda ejercer el derecho al voto, que es una forma también de, de, de luchar.